Days with Will. I am Caroline Norton. Let's get started. So today we are going to be talking about adaptations of Shakespeare's plays. But first, we need to talk about why Shakespeare's plays are performed so frequently today. And there are a few reasons for that. Some are more on the logistical side, some technical things, and then some are more creative. Let's talk about the logistical reasoning first. Well, like we talked about in an earlier episode, copyright laws did not exist when Shakespeare was writing his plays, which basically means everything he wrote is in the public domain, meaning it's totally free online for you to view and for you to perform. Theaters don't have to pay royalties to perform Shakespeare's plays. Royalties are a, a fancy word meaning you have to pay money to perform a person's show. That way artists get paid. But because William Shakespeare died 450 years ago, we don't need to worry about paying him anymore. So that's the big logistical reason why Shakespeare is done quite often, because it's easy to perform. You don't have to pay anything. But Shakespeare's plays are also done really frequently because, like we've talked about a lot on Wednesdays with Will, his plays are accessible for people of all ages, races, backgrounds, gender identities to understand and to connect to. And the reason we're going to be talking about today, Shakespeare's plays have a lot of room for creative license. Shakespeare, when he wrote, he didn't specify a lot of details regarding the way that casting should be done or the setting of the plays or the time period, you know, where they took place. Normally, when you open up a play, you have a list of every character that's featured in the show. And in addition, oftentimes you have a description of those characters, meaning the playwright is telling you what race, what gender identity, what age bracket the actor playing that character should be. Shakespeare didn't do that in his plays. When you open up a Shakespeare play, you do have a list of every character that is featured in that show, but there are no character descriptions. All we have to go off of is the text. Now, in lieu of that, Shakespeare will often give us clues in his plays as to how the actors playing these characters should look. For example, in Othello, Othello should be played by a black man. In The Merchant of Venice, Shylock should be played by a Jewish man. That makes sense. In A Midsummer Night's Dream, he tells us that Helena is tall and Hermia is short. That's doable. He gives us little clues like that throughout his plays that let us know, oh, okay, this character should look like this or should be this. And that helps with casting, but all those other characters that don't have specifications written in the text, totally open to your interpretation. Now, another thing that you will often find in a play is a, a setting. The playwright will tell you where the show takes place and when the show takes place. For example, we know that Arthur Miller's play The Crucible takes place in Salem in the early 1600s. But Shakespeare doesn't exactly let us know that. Now, there are sometimes clues as to locations. For example, we know that The Merchant of Venice takes place in Venice. <laughs> the Two Gentlemen of Verona takes place in Verona. We know from the text that A Midsummer Night's Dream takes place in Athens. We get little hints like that. But a lot of the locations in Shakespeare's plays are either vague or completely made up. <laughs> like in Twelfth Night. That takes place in the land of Illyria, which is a fictional location. So you can create whatever environment that you want for those shows. And, I mean, you can also do a production of Midsummer that doesn't take place in Athens, or Two Gentlemen of Verona that doesn't actually take place in Verona. It could take place in a fictional town of Verona, New Jersey. <laughs> because you have that creative license due to the fact that there are no copyright laws. Because you have all of this freedom in doing a Shakespearean play, you can adapt his text however you want. 
you could do a production of Twelfth Night that takes place in Las Vegas, Nevada. <laughs> you could do a production of Romeo and Juliet that takes place in Milwaukee. There are so many options for you. But then the question becomes, how do we convey that? Well, you can convey your time period, your location through costumes. Um, for example, if you're doing a production of Romeo and Juliet in Milwaukee in the winter, maybe everyone is wearing winter coats and big hats and, and they're all bundled up. If you do a production of Othello that takes place on the moon, everyone can be wearing spacesuits and be dressed like astronauts. If you do a production of Pericles, Prince of Tyre, that takes place from the 1970s to the, to the mid-90s, then you can go from leisure suits to big teased hair and, and then all the way to, to jellies and, and high-waisted jeans. The possibilities are endless. You can use costuming really to your advantage when you are setting up a, a Shakespeare play in a different time period or location. You can also help to convey these changes that you want to make through music. Shakespeare's plays all feature music, beautiful songs that were written way, way back in the 15 and 1600s. Now, you can, of course, use those songs still and, and put your own spin on them, maybe put them to a, a techno tune instead of the classic melody, or you can actually replace those songs with modern songs. I mean, you'd have to get permission, of course, to do that, but you could do a production of Hamlet where, where the two gravediggers are singing Firework by Katy Perry. <laughs> And that can really help to modernize the text as well. Another thing that you can do to adapt Shakespeare's text is by switching up the casting. Back in Shakespeare's time, he wrote all of his characters to be played by men, even the women. Remember that episode when we talked about the English sumptuary laws? Well, every time we put a woman on stage, we're adapting Shakespeare's text. That's something we can even go further in. You could do a production of The Taming of the Shrew, but have Catherine be played by a man and have Petruchio played by a woman. You could do a production of Romeo and Juliet when Romeo and Juliet are both women. You could do a production of The Tempest where the actor playing Prospero is non-binary. There are so many options for you. You can really twist the story that's being told uh, based on simple things like casting and costuming and music choices. All of these elements work together to create your own unique adaptation of Shakespeare's plays. Another way that you can adapt Shakespeare's text is by adding or subtracting dialogue. Again, because there's no copyright on, this, on Shakespeare's plays, you're free to add in your own words if you want to. And you're also free to cut whatever you want. With, with Summit, we do 75 minute adaptations of Shakespeare's plays. Most of Shakespeare's texts in their entirety run about two and a half to three hours long. That's a long show. <laughs> so we cut it down to 75 minutes. Now we don't add words because we're already so pressed for time that we just focus on cutting some things and then we're left with a shorter and more condensed version of this really long play. But I have seen versions of Shakespeare where they've taken Shakespeare's words and completely modernized them. They've paraphrased all of Shakespeare's text so it's still his story, but it's being told in more modern language. There are a lot of famous examples of people taking Shakespeare's texts and adapting them for their own. I mean, Summit, of course, we're always doing adaptations of Shakespeare's text. But then we also have even bigger productions, like the Much Ado About Nothing that was just performed by the Public Theater at the Delacorte. That was an all-black cast performing Much Ado About Nothing. It was totally revolutionary. Then we also have a lot of movie adaptations of Shakespeare. Now, I'm not talking about like how 10 Things I Hate About You is like Taming of the Shrew. I'm talking about the real Shakespearean text being done in a movie format. 
Kenneth Branagh did a lot of versions of these. He did Hamlet, he did A Much Ado, and all of his versions have little tweaks in, in the location and the, in the time period. And he's not the only one to do it. There are so many movie adaptations of Shakespeare plays that you can watch for free if you check them out at your public library. Um, I'm sure there are some on different streaming sites that you can watch as well. All of these different ways that people have taken Shakespeare's texts and put a little spin on them, a little personal twist. And that's what we are going to be doing this week. My challenge for you for this week is to take one of Shakespeare's plays, whichever one you want, one that you know a lot about or one that you want to do a little bit more research on, take one of his plays and bring your own spin on it. Create your own adaptation of a Shakespeare play. Now, you don't have to sit here and write the whole thing out. You absolutely can write it all out in story form if you want, but you can also draw a, a picture, create an image board, make a zine like we did a few weeks ago. Use whatever artistic medium that you have at your disposal and create your own unique adaptation of a Shakespearean play. You can use one of the examples that we talked about earlier in this episode or you can come up with something that is totally unique to you. Regardless, I can't wait to see what you come up with. As always, send your projects to us at info at summitplayerstheater.com and I will see you all next week. Until then, stay safe and be kind. Bye!